Thank you, Doug. I wanted to just say a few words about Reverend Yaten, Yaten excuse me, uh, before we get into our call to worship. She's a graduate of Boston University School of Theology and is ordained by the American Baptist Churches. She has served churches in Chelmsford and Lowell, and she lives in Worcester. She's a member of the First Baptist Church in Worcester. So please join me in welcoming Reverend Yetten. Would you all please rise and join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, how excellent is your greatness. You are clothed with majesty and splendor. You wrap yourself with light as with a cloak and spread out the heavens like a curtain. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And is our custom, please join us in the passing of Christ's peace. And if you could remain standing, please, and join us in our opening hymn, Lift High the Cross, number 159. Remain standing, please, and join me in our opening prayer, also found in your bulletin. <coughs> oh Lord, we thank you for your presence here with us today and every day. Thank you for your love and your grace, your guidance and correction, your healing and the hope we have in you. We offer you all praise and glory. We gather in worship this morning. Bind us together in the heart of Christ so that we may be your faithful people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If there are any children that would like to go with Yushi this morning for Sunday school? Our 
scripture reading this morning is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here ends our reading. Will you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Think for a minute about a favorite teacher you had at school or a boss at work who you really liked or respected. What was this person like? I bet some of the things that come to mind are kind, fair, someone who is good at what they do and helps others to be successful. It would be someone who creates a pleasant environment to be in. And if we dig deeper, I bet a lot of these people have a sense of humility about them and a real willingness to serve others. It's the teacher who goes above and beyond, offering extra help at recess, or who tailors a lesson to the student who learns differently, or who notices and responds to the subtle emotional needs that don't fit squarely into the lesson plan. It might be the manager who jumps in behind the counter or busses tables when things are busy. The boss who buys pizza for the team to celebrate a success or who regularly takes a turn emptying the office dishwasher. It's the person who's willing to admit when they are wrong. These are people who in one way or another serve those they work with, using their power to lift others up rather than put them down. But not all teachers or bosses are like that. Some make clear from day one that there is a strict hierarchy and some people's opinions or needs are more valuable than others. They take a my way or the highway approach. Or maybe they do exactly what is required of them and not one bit more. They use their power to lift themselves higher or make themselves more comfortable as they stand on the backs of those below them. Now, some of these people might just be jerks, but some might fall into these patterns without even realizing it. Power can be an attractive thing. If you spend time in some kind of hierarchy, you probably want to be at the top of it. And when you get to the top, you want the perks of being at the top. When you get to the point where you no longer have to do the kinds of service you did before, most people don't want to turn around and choose to serve anyway. They get distracted by the perks at the top, and they forget what it was like for them before and what it is still like for those in other positions. 
To embrace humility and service often involves going against the grain of some powerful personal and cultural forces. This message of going against the cultural values and assumptions to be a servant of others is a key message of Jesus. He has been telling it to his disciples in many different ways. When Jesus first mentioned his death and resurrection, Peter rebuked him, and Jesus had to give a deeper explanation of what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. The next time Jesus told them about his death and resurrection, they still didn't understand, and a discussion broke out among them about who was the greatest. So Jesus took a child, and said that whoever welcomes a child like this in his name welcomes not only him, but also the one who sent him. Right before today's reading from Mark, Jesus has just mentioned his death and resurrection a third time. But James and John still don't seem to understand. And they respond in the same old ways, asking that they might be the ones to sit at his right and his left in glory. It's a little dumbfounding that they still don't seem to get it. It seems like as Jesus spoke about his death and resurrection not once, not twice, but three times, they tuned out and just kept on with their same old concerns. They knew he was someone special, and they wanted to ride his coattails to the top. Or maybe they just plain loved Jesus and loved being at his side. They didn't want to lose that prime position to give it up to someone else. Or maybe they did hear and did understand, and it was just harder to take in than they realized. After all, if the cup that Jesus must drink is death, are we ready to drink that cup? And are we ready to walk that path? For most of us, I bet the answer is no. And when it is yes, it might be, yes, I can do that. But Jesus, I need you to promise to be right by my side the whole time. Maybe James and John fully grasped what he was saying, and it all got a little too real. And the only way to get through was to envision themselves sitting next to Jesus on the other side. But whether they were running after power or running away from fear or just plain not paying attention, their response totally misses the mark. How many times have we noticed ourselves missing the mark in our own understanding of what Jesus calls us to do? Perhaps we read something in the Bible or another book or listened to a sermon or had a conversation with someone that left us feeling enlightened, like that was an important lesson we just learned. Or maybe we noticed something was important, but just glossed over it, thinking it was so obvious that it wasn't really worth dwelling on because we've got this already. And then a few days later, we catch ourselves lying or judging or gossiping or ignoring someone, and we realize that whatever that important lesson was, it didn't sink in quite as far as we thought. It happens to me all the time. I preach a message on Sunday, and by Tuesday, God has the opportunity to say to me, hey, remember that thing you said on Sunday? Maybe you should do that. As much as I love to give the disciples a hard time about some of their trips and stumbles, I'm not sure I would do much better in their shoes. So Jesus has to remind them again and again about the path of humility and service and sacrifice so that it can finally get lodged in their minds and hearts. And then when the time comes and it really counts, they can actually do it. They and we need to hear the message over and over again because it's really hard to be humble and put others first when we find ourselves in a position of power. 
It is tempting to follow a path where we are served rather than being of service to others. So being in a position of power might actually make it a little harder to follow Jesus faithfully. Well, believe it or not, this might actually be good news for the church. There was a time in this country when the church had a lot of power. It was the center of life. The church buildings were located right in the middle of town and were the highest point that could be seen. All the powerful people in society were members of the church, and it was a key place to go to network if you wanted to climb any kind of social ladder. From the time of the Emperor Constantine onward, church and state were linked in the Western world, either formally or informally, through channels of power. Even with our separation of church and state in this country, for most of our history, the church was a powerful cultural force to be reckoned with. <clears throat> well, in many ways, those days are gone. The culture has shifted, our numbers have declined, and we are no longer at the center of things. I'm not saying the church is dying or that it isn't important or doesn't still have a strong role to play, but something has changed. We can no longer assume that the leaders of civic life or industry are active, faithful Christians and have our best interests in mind. The local power players are not necessarily in our midst. If I go somewhere and say that I'm a pastor, people are just as likely to think I'm weird as they are to think I'm someone worth listening to. But that's okay, because where one door has closed, another has opened. Jesus was both a powerful and relatively powerless person. He gathered crowds, was respected by many, inspired, committed followers, and people from all over sought him out. But he was not part of any established power structure. By all accounts, he lived on the margins of society and was at the bottom of most hierarchies. He was not rich or Roman or part of a ruling family. His power was through humble service and relationships. It looked different from the power structures around him. On the surface, it looked like nothing, but it was actually so much more. Think back to your favorite teacher or boss or that powerful figure in your life. The authority they had over you was probably not because they had either the right or the ability to demand it from us. We respect them and give them authority and follow their lead because we want to. There is a power to their humility and generosity and the relationships they work to develop. Their memory sticks with us because in many ways that influence is more powerful than those who resort to power plays. It was the same with the early Christian communities. They didn't have a lot of social power in their early days. They were the minority group who a lot of people thought were either a little strange or downright heretical or maybe even dangerous. But people were inspired by them. Their leader had just been tortured and killed in brutal form, and yet these people still had faith in him, in his message, and in their God. These were people who reached out to the sick and hungry and outcasts in selfless ways. This was a community who had little, but came together to create something more than themselves alone. Something about them drew people in. Like Jesus, they were less concerned with appearing respectable and more concerned with caring for each other in deeply personal ways. The future of the church may be linked to how well we get back to some of these roots of faith, service, and relationship. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47 is often a go-to passage to see what that early church looked like in those first days 
and to think about what we might be called to do today. It reads, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Notice that this is not a church of powerful people enjoying their power and using it for their own comfort and well-being. This is also not a church of privilege, serving with an attitude that they are the ones with something to give, while others do not. The Church of Acts is a church of service through relationships in community. They know each other. They care about each other. They form a community where their gifts are shared together. For Jesus, service always had that personal touch. He saw beyond just the physical ailments to the personal and spiritual needs right, uh, sitting right alongside them. He saw and listened where others only passed by. People were never objects of charity to him. They were children of God who were welcome to join his family of followers. Service was all about relationship. From what I know of this congregation, you are in a position like many churches today. Being in a nice tall building in the center of town doesn't mean the same thing it did a generation or two ago. You built a faithful church with great programs and served your community well. <clears throat> and then the world changed and that trajectory didn't go where you thought it would. And that's a really hard thing. But unlike some other churches, this congregation seems to have service at its core and has for a long time. It's what draws people in and brings you together as you serve your community and your God. And that is a beautiful thing that is at the heart of the mission of Jesus in this world. But a challenge for many congregations and for many Christians is to go beyond the traditions and programs of the past and to go beyond the kinds of service we know and with which we are comfortable, and to move deeper into relationships with each other. There is service in bringing a meal to someone when they are sick. There is also service in inviting them to dinner when all is well. There is service in praying for someone who's going through a rough time. There is also service in simply praying together regularly as part of our lives of faith. There is service in giving to someone who is in need, and there is service in recognizing that we all have something to give to each other. The kingdom of God will have some grand and glorious testimonies to the love of God shown in service and sacrifice. But the kingdom will be built brick by brick, person by person, in the small and ordinary acts of kindness and service that are part of our relationships with each other. Don't underestimate that, because it is often in these small and ordinary ways that we meet the deep hungers of our own hearts and make this a space that feeds the hunger in other people's hearts in ways more than they or we know. James and John started their conversation with Jesus by saying to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Well, we can see how that can get off track really easily. What they should have said was, Teacher, we want you to show us what to ask for. And I think perhaps that should be the church, the prayer of the church today. Teacher, 
show us what to ask for. So let us pray together. Oh Jesus, show us what to ask for. The world is changing. The church is changing. We don't always know where we are going, and we have some mixed feelings about all of it. We need your help. You have promised that when we ask, it will be given. When we seek, we will find. And when we knock, the door will be opened. Show us who to ask, what to seek, and where to knock, so that we can love and serve as your faithful people. We pray in your holy name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together hymn number 430, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. <clears throat> You may be seated. <clears throat> As we come to our time of con sharing concerns and prayer, are there any joys or concerns you'd like to share together this morning? Oh, my friend, in hospice. ...of the changes in our midst and the ever-present reality of endings and new beginnings. Enfold us in the arms of faith so that endings are always linked to your promise of new life. In the midst of the struggles of our world, may all that causes harm come to an end in this season, and may we see your gift of new and abundant life spring up in its place. May seasons of loneliness turn to comfort and companionship. May illness turn to health. May hunger turn to security and satisfaction. May violence turn to peace and justice. O oh God, we know that this path to healing and new life is your will for us and is already in motion. But we also know that some seasons last longer than others, and the path of healing and wholeness is not always in the form we anticipate. We pray for those dealing with chronic health concerns. May visions of healing expand, and may we be surprised at the ways you work in our lives, in our bodies, and in our minds. We pray for all living in economically vulnerable positions, dealing with debt, underemployment, 
and difficult financial decisions. We pray that daily bread will never cease to arrive and that needs will be met with the grace of your abundance. We pray for all who experience the effects of racism when it is loud and when it is subtle. Heal us all of this sin and its effects so that we can live in the light of the kingdom of heaven. We pray for all who are asking, how long, O Lord, how long? Be with us. Be with us in the waiting. Fill us again and again with hope and give us bread for the journey. O Lord, we ask you to hear our prayers. Those we have spoken out loud, those we have prayed in silence, and those buried so deep in our hearts, they are known to you alone. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we have so many ways in which we can follow Jesus and serve our neighbors. It is in what we give in all aspects of our being, and the giving of our financial resources is one of those ways. So please be in a, a state of prayerful presence now as we receive our tithes and offerings. Join me in the prayer of thanksgiving printed in your bulletins. Gracious God, we thank you for these gifts and for all of the hands that gave them. We ask you to bless them that they may be used faithfully in your service, in this congregation, in this community, and in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us also bless these offerings of food that have been given this morning. Oh God, we thank you for the ways you provide for us with manna from heaven in miraculous form, with the fruits of our labors, and through the gifts of our neighbors. 
God, we ask you to bless these gifts of food that they will nourish bodies and that they will nourish the spirits of those who give and those who receive. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now I invite you to remain standing as we sing together our closing hymn, number 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Thank you. 